My first, my first modem was a 300 baud Hayes uh, external size of a shoebox like that. <laughs> Huh? 24K baud modem. How fast is it? 24. Oh, 24K. Minus 300. Slower. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so I've been around a long time in the online world, and I was very fortunate to have just had a, a career that has spanned a variety of aspects of the web in terms of web design and development, particularly focusing. Uh, on web standards uh, as that whole concept emerged. Um, so I, I, will, uh, I will tell you just a little bit about me uh, just to get started and then I'm going to ask a few people to volunteer some information about themselves and where they're at in their particular uh, uh, careers and what they're really focusing on. And then we'll get into some information about what's new in um, some of our favorite browsers and some things you have to know about how to deal with, of course, IE8. Um, so, a couple of things about me. I'm, I'm a web evangelist now with Opera Software. Uh, before that, I spent a year and a half working as the standards and interop consultants on the Microsoft ID team to assist them <laughs> in moving towards standards, which we, which I consider a partial success, and you'll see why I mean partial um, in a bit. But uh, it was a very difficult year and a half, and uh, I am much happier now. Uh, being friends with them as opposed to being in a relationship where it was constantly com combative. Because right? they're very wonderful people at that organization. Um, and of course, the former group leader of the Web Standards Project. How many people are familiar with WASP and what WASP has done and is doing? Uh, originally started by Jeffrey Zeldman and a couple of other people um, interested in seeing, actually at that time, better implementation of the DOM between Netscape and IE. Uh, the Web Standards Project has now merged to do a number of very important things, uh, including a fabulous, uh, for those of you who might be educators, we have a fabulous open framework for uh, curriculum in, in adult education, which also can be used for and modified for any other types of educational methods via Interact. So it's interact.wasp.org. You want to take a look at that if you are ever in a position to have to educate on the standards. And I'm the mother of a lot of books, about 35 the last time I counted, including the bestsellers, Zen of CSS Design and Transcending CSS. Anybody have those books? In their, in their, uh, yeah, if you, if you do CSS at all, they're really a couple of very beautiful books. Uh, Dave Shea and I worked on the first one, Andy Clark, a wonderful designer from the UK, and I worked on the second one. And of course, I'm a firm believer in the open web. And what that means is really, it's a re-embracing of the original idea and vision as posed by Tim Berners-Lee in the early days of the web, which is anybody, anywhere, any platform, any user agent gets to that data, right? That content. And that is, of course, something that we have um, we started out well with, but have been challenged by as browsers began to compete. Feature sets and those features being within the standards. So instead of implementing aspects of CSS, uh, things like Marquee, you know, came out of IE for, you know, in response to Netscape's brilliant blink. Don't we wish for those days again? Anybody? No? <laughs> okay, so that's a, a little bit about me. And um, if anybody wants to chat, by the way, after the session, and if there's more questions, um, I'll be happy. It's a short session, and we have a lot to cover. So I'll be happy to chat afterwards. But I do want a few volunteers, maybe one to three people, to, about three people, to, to uh, tell me, name, uh, what your role is, and what your biggest challenge in web development is today. So who's going to be my first dick to volunteer? I will victimize you. Oh, we got one back there. Would you stand up so everybody can uh, meet you? Hi. Even walks to the microphone. I'm impressed. That's a professional call. My name is, my name is Constantine Gustavus. I work for uh, the Discovery Channel, Discovery Communications, and I'm a web producer. One of, uh, I would say one of the biggest uh, challenges that we meet is uh, to, 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 keep, to keep our our users loyal to the brand and always to return to the site. That's, as a producer, I would say that's uh, the, so the biggest content. challenge. The content is everything for you. you know, making right. it interesting and interactive and content rich for your users. What a wonderful thing to hear. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Nice jacket, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm a matrix. <laughs> I am a matrix. 
Um, my name is Chuck Maynard. I'm the uh, head of um, the Sybase Developers Network for Sybase Inc. out of, uh, of California. Um, and our problem is, is browser compatibility. We have, we're trying to integrate a lot of, um, a lot of new content into, the, into our system, but you know, we still have a huge number of people coming in on IE6 and coming in on all kinds of things. Nobody has problems with IE6. Not at all. No. Um, no. Never heard of them. Um, but, and, and then worse, worse is that the layout problems we have as well. I mean, I'm just kidding, but the consistency of look and feel of all the different browsers that we're driving is absolutely insane mm -hmm. for years. So. That's a very unique and rare problem in our industry, so we may have to spend some time after class. <laughs> But no, seriously, um, I, I feel that with all my heart and soul because that's what we're doing in the open web concept, which I was talking about. It speaks directly to that issue that we've lost that con control of that beautiful idea, and now we have to struggle with developers. It makes our life our lives much more difficult to have to test and redesign and constantly quibble with with implementations. Hi, Hi. Um, my name is Dennis Lembry. And um, I guess traditionally I'm a, I'm a web developer. Uh, recently I started working for Research in Motion, um, working on software for Blackberry. Oh, awesome. Um, yeah, so it's pretty cool. I mean, the biggest challenge I think I have is coming from the website is just kind of um, being able to use, you know, and I'm a web standards and accessibility advocate, and just trying to apply those things to the browsers on the mobile devices. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the whole new <laughs> in the world. Like so, that, right? I mean, yeah. that, not only for the compatibility, but yeah. even the processing speed and yeah. um, interpretation and stuff like that is, is challenging. Very, very challenging. And yeah. just a plug, I'm, I'm also the creator of AccessibleTwitter.com. Okay, <laughs> Molly.com, at, at Molly.com and Twitter. Um, how many people here are working in mobile like this gentleman as well? So, we're going to look at a little bit of a, uh, we're talking briefly about media queries, which of course is an emerging. Um, emerging way of dealing with some of those issues. Not too long ago, um, Jacob Nielsen wrote a, an article about developing different sites for different uh, reasons. Like, so in other words, you would have your mo mobile Twitter, and then you would have your, uh, your screen Twitter, but these would be different sites. And it was such an old school way of looking at things, because we really are moving into a world now where we have the media query technologies emerging in our common browsers. And once we really have that, it would be, it's going to be, it's beyond just having separate style sheets, it's having separate style sheets that aim at specific media content types, like you can describe, describe uh, uh, screen size and all of that. So it's really kind of interesting stuff. So we'll take a look at that. That's in uh, CSS3, that kind of stuff. Okay, that was great, thank you. Um, let's continue. And of course, uh, we start with the specs. Okay, and t t tell you a little about, a bit about what's going on in the see and, and in some cases other related standards bodies. I give a little bit of a, a concept and, and a, sort of a state of the sort of sort of the state of the web specs in general. How many people have heard of HTML5? How many people wish they never heard of HTML5? <laughs> How many people go, what the heck is HTML5? What is it that I finalized? Pardon me? What year is it that I finalized? I couldn't hear you. What year is it supposed to finalize? Okay, so here's a, that's a very good point. The gentleman says, what year is it supposed to finalize? Well, it's very important to remember that just because a spec isn't done doesn't mean it isn't used. How many people here are using CSS 2.1? All of you probably if you're using CSS. Okay? Is CSS 2.1 a finished spec? Guess what? It's not. Yet it is completely implemented now in IE8. It's got complete implementations in other browsers as well, and we use it on a day-to-day -day basis. So the point is, it's not what the specification says, it's what gets implemented. And what we're going to find out today is that HTML5 is being implemented in every single known browser. How interesting is that? Because there's some really good technologies and interesting technologies. But is HTML5 a difficult beast? Yes, and there are definite issues that we have to go through when we think about it. Just a brief uh, overview of what happened, how HTML5 came about. Oh my goodness, I see a bean. Anyway, um, <laughs> can't miss them. Usually. <laughs> so HTML5, essentially what happened there was that you had uh, a bunch of people, a little bit of discontent going on um, at the W3C because XHTML had emerged, and of course we, we work with XHTML, we think we work with XHTML all the time. 
But there is a browser, namely IE, that has not implemented proper MIME types for the support of XHTML in the ideal as an XML application. Okay, so we're still serving XHTML if we're using the syntax, we're serving it in almost all cases, unless you are a, a bit of a guru and, and or don't care about the IE um, issue, uh, which is not a luxury that most professionals have. Um, it, it just wasn't, you know, it wasn't meeting the goals that people saw. And so they, they, this offshoot, some people from inside the W3C and the other people who had an interest in seeing HTML uh, evolve with the web, because the web becoming more uh, application-centric and all of that, it became pretty um, much of a, of a sort of counter-response to this fact that XHTML wasn't really going for it. So the What Working Group was formed by these individuals, uh, led mostly by Ian Hickson. We have Anna Van Kesteren, who is a colleague at Opera Software, um, and a bunch of other people, Dean Edwards, Henry Savonin, some very, very interesting young guys who really put together, uh, they wrote a spec within a year. Of course, it was really mostly one person doing all the work, and when that happens, you can get stuff done. And that also is a problem because it's a very monocultural environment there. So what, what the W3C tried to do with this was embrace it by creating an HTML5 working group within the W3C and bringing <coughs> the basic work that the What Working Group had done in that year into the W3C as a baseline. And so now HTML5 is being standardized by the W3C. Um, there are 600 members of the public working group. So you can imagine how interesting uh, a day with that group is. Um, and really, I'm not sure how, you know, how, what we're going to see. But I can tell you this much. The fact that browsers are already implementing aspects of HTML5 is an alert to you as developers that you need to know as much as you need to know. Okay. And I'll, I'll talk, talk a little bit more about what exactly in HTML5 we want to be, uh, want to be looking at. Of course, what's happening to XHTML? It really was a great idea, um, but I don't think that it is going to be seeing the light of day as an XML application. I say that cautiously because you never know, right? IE6 said we will never, IE said we will never uh, uh, release another browser. Now we have IE7 and IE8, right? Uh, HTML working group said we will never release another HTML after 4.01. Well, hello. <laughs> so I would not speculate. You never know. But the truth is, is that from an absolute um, usage, public day-to-day -day usage, we cannot use XHTML and serve it as an application of XML. Okay? We have to serve it as text HTML if we want it to work cross-browser. CSS 2.1 is finally maturing. It's, uh, IEA is, is say, claiming CSS 2.1 complete. This is uh, excluding, of course, the RL features, which almost everybody has excluded anyway, except for Opera. Um, so W3C has put a, uh, I'm a, a member of the CSS working group, and one of the things that we've been told by the CSS, uh, by, the, by the W3C advisory committee is if we do not come out with the spec, and finish that spec this year, there will be no CSS 2.1, and we'll simply move on to CSS 3. But this is how this kind of goes to that commentary about HTML5, you know, when's it going to be done? Because out of Ian Hickson's mouth was 10 years, right? The spec, in terms of the full spec, but in terms of the implementation, again, here we see full implementation of CSS 2.1 in IE8. Halcom Lee, of course, co father of CSS and CTO of Opera Software at South by Southwest uh, a couple weeks ago, actually publicly said that he was very proud of Microsoft for doing this. And, and anybody who knows, the rivalry that goes on there because, you know, Opera is, su is suing Microsoft on a constant basis. Um, so it was very nice to see that. And Chris Wilson was uh, right in the front row. He's the lead IE developer. And so it was a very interesting time in the browser history to see that. Now CSS3 is also being implemented. And again, here's a spec that probably won't be completely finished for a decade. So you can say the same thing about CSS3, right? But what's being implemented becomes what's being used and what's useful. So that's what we really have to focus on. Um, the, the neat thing about CSS3 is that it was built in a modular way. So in other words, we have text modules and event modules and various different kinds of modules within the CSS um, spec itself. And this enables modules to be shipped faster. So in other words, we finish a module with the W3C, 
and then it can be implemented. And of course, many of these things are being implemented anyway. Um, there's also the prefix to spec method. I'm sure many of you have seen this, you know, the dash mods, things like that. What we've been doing now is we've been encouraging anybody who's creating advanced uh, compliance in browsers with, spec, with specs that are not finished to use uh, their, their, uh, their da dash with their prefix, the, uh, the browser prefix for that, until they're complete and, and everybody can support them. So that way we, we're trying for a better baseline of, of interop, trying to be the operative word. There's you know, all kinds of neat things in CSS3 for the designers amongst you, as well as the developers. We have incredible um, power now over fonts, where the font, the at Google font face, right, we get to do some really neat things. We have animations and effects. Safari, and, and especially at WebKit, recent versions is just kicking butt with this stuff. I mean, really, really nice animations and, and um, different kinds of uh, like uh, gradient effects and things of that nature. We have opacity. We have really beautiful borders and backgrounds. And I'll send you, um, I'll send you to a, a, a resource that where you can see what, what each of these what browsers are doing in CSS3. So other awesomeness that's coming out of the W3C and being implemented in browsers today, we have Way Aria, which is a piece of accessibility, very, very um, helpful for the application, uh, because uh, as many of you know, who, uh, who's ever you know, worked to create an accessible site, um, one issue, of course, is when you're dealing with applications, and you have complex applications that require interaction, a lot of forms and things of that nature, it really becomes um, very difficult for certain people to navigate through that kind of experience. And so what WayArta does is add the ability for developers to put hints and commentary and sign rules, essentially, to the various aspects of an application so that anybody who's blind or uh, disabled in some way cannot uh, work with that application in the way that you and I would would perhaps have more information to be able to understand the application and work within its interface. It's very simple, and it's being implemented, uh, it is implemented in a number of browsers, and it's being implemented, and all, all browsers are, are examining this, because it's, it's a fairly quick implementation, so it's, it's a very, it will be a very helpful thing. SVG 1.1, you know, we wonder about SVG, it's this amazing, amazing technology, and I can show you a few things here with demos that I have, but, you know, again, we have no support in... IE. Yeah, oh yeah, that one, that browser, yeah, that one. So, and, you know, I think that this is the next step. This is the next push from the evangelists and the advocates and the rebels amongst us. The next push, really, for, uh, for advocacy is to go after IE for SVG support. Um, to me, at this point, it seems more important than getting XHTML in there because we have a markup. We, we have enough markup right now. Really, you know, what we really need is to get more application-centric stuff going on. We also have widgets and applications, be, a variety of uh, formats being specced out by the W3C right now. Um, the XML HTTP request object, of course, which is um, cornerstone of what we call what we call AJAX. Um, is uh, being standardized now in W3C and is gifted to W3C by none other than Microsoft. So with one hand a slap and with the other, with the other a kiss. And this is particularly interesting to me, of course, and this, this we can relate um, exactly to the, the application. Um, the fact that websites are no longer sites, we really are looking toward real uh, intense interactivity, application of all evolution, and things of that name, of that type. So what we have is we see this rise of JavaScript. You know, JavaScript used to be seen by standardistas as sort of a bad child. But now we're re-examining that because we're realizing JavaScript is the glue of the web. It does amazing, amazing things. It can help us with problems in our browsers. It can help us with the compatibility issues. It can help us achieve all kinds of interact interactivity. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. That must have been really good. Um, and we really have a sort of um, emerging idea of, of JavaScript also in the accessible environment. So there's, there's a very uh, responsible new age of JavaScripters in people like Jeremy Keith and uh, uh, you know, just a couple of other, like Dean Edwards does a lot of work. Um, really very, very uh, noble people doing incredible work with JavaScript. So um, we see this, we see JSON. Uh, how many people work with JSON? 
It's a, it's a really clever little spec. Uh, Douglas Crawford, who wrote it, showed it to me on the back of the business card. That's where he spec'd it out. <laughs> it's on the back of his business card. It's like, now that's a spec. <laughs> who needs W3C, right? Because, I mean, you know, I mean, how, many are, how many people here love like, to go over and read those specs of W3C? You know, live to go home and do that. Nobody? <laughs> oh, come on. Who's going to do that? Nobody. 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 Nobody.
Uh, one thing I found, I thought I was going to find like, a lot of CSS specificity kind of problems. Actually, what I found in IA, you know, it was really remarkable uh, when I was doing a lot of testing on, on the betas when I was still over at Microsoft, um, was that we really uh, uh, created a very good standards browser because it has no mercy. If you don't close a table cell, remember what, what used to happen, it just wouldn't display a page. Well, now the page just breaks. I mean, it just goes into absolute chaos. Whatever you write in that document is what that browser, in its highest and best form, is going to try to display. Okay. So the metaphor that I want to use about what happened in this process, once the meta element uh, UA compatibility issue was uh, introduced, is that after um, the first the first thing they said was that you're going to have to opt out of web standards. So this was the first move, which of course just makes no sense. It's like going into a into a, a, a car manufacturer and saying, you know, I need a new car, but I don't have much, enough money to to, to 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 buy the brakes. So I think I'll opt out of the brakes, right? You can't opt out of the brakes. These are a standard necessity, okay? So this is really what I see as Microsoft having done in that first step. Okay, they said, well, we're going to make you opt. Out, right, and, and or, or rather, you have to opt into standards, which is not the way to build a browser. Okay, you want a standards-based browser, and then if there's another, you know, reason that you have something else for people to see, then you opt into that. So what happened is a huge fight broke out in the war room at, at Microsoft IE. Um, they don't make all the war room for a reason, um, and. Bill Gates was involved, and I was involved, and Dina Kamovich, and a bunch of people, and we all, we all fought with each other, and finally, they changed the, the you know, the, the, this got out to the public, the public went nuts, the developers, probably many of you saw um, developers writing about this, and it was on this part, and it was just really a mess, and with the pressure of the community, both the internal uh, agitators like myself and other people on the IE team, um, who really, every day, take their jobs, you know, and, you know, put their jobs on the line, and you would not believe what goes on up there. No, you probably would, but <laughs> but anyway, out of that, the, the, you know, incredible community response, and Microsoft said, okay, we're going to switch it, and we're going to say, now you have to opt, you have to opt out of, of standards mode. Okay, so that was great. Everybody's like, yeah, IE is coming out, and the default, the default is standards. In other words, all my CSS is going to work. Everything's going to work great. There's has layout is gone, which was a big, big pain for those of us working with layout in that particular browser. So, so we have a really nice, high-performing standard browser. Well, everything was well and good. Um, so now we didn't have to opt out of the breaks. The breaks came standard and in the cost. Okay. Then something very strange happened. This little button appeared on one of our betas out of the IE. I was no longer with the company at this time. So I became very suspicious. What is this? How many people have heard about the compatibility issue? And it's not a, it's a compatibility list. We have to get our, our nomenclature right. It's not a blacklist. So if you've heard the word blacklist in relation to this, please don't think blacklist because that's erroneous. A blacklist has a very, very different connotation. Okay? But essentially what it happened is that they basically put a button that allows for IE7 compatibility mode. So if you get to a site, and it's broken, you click this button and it'll render as IE7 as opposed to IE8. It switches the Trident engine. Okay? Now, what Microsoft did is that it said, okay, if enough times, if this happens enough times on a given site, that information is going to be taken by us and we are going to assume that the site is now always not standard. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, so first we had to opt into the brakes, then we had to opt out of the brakes. Now if I touch the brakes too much, they stop working. And that's really what I see going on there. Nevertheless, this is what we have. So how do we deal with it? Okay, so what you have to do is you have to, you have to check which mode you're in, you have to be the master of your mode. So essentially these are some of the things that, that uh, Aaron put together for a presentation um, that the Web Standards Project did. I thought it was so nice that I thought, okay, let, let me use this. So props to Aaron Gustafson of the Web Standards Project and easydesigns.net. So essentially what happens is Microsoft maintains this compatibility list and IE is always looking at this list and that information comes back. So if you are 
um, in standards mode, okay, it comes back. If, if, you, if you have the meta element I8 in there, it comes back to Microsoft as standards and you're fine. If you have, um, if you are on the compatibility list, if you make it to the compatibility list, you end up with I7 if you have no I8 meta element in there. And then the trigger, this is what happens with, with the button, okay? So if you opted in to provide usage stats to Microsoft, the browser is going to inform Microsoft about all of, you know, what, what, the, what it sees and, and which, which uh, engine it's using to interpret what it sees. But the other, this is, this is the piece right here that bothers me. So it works in the other direction. So if my page doesn't have that meta element, um, you know, it, it could end up on that list, on that compatibility list, and forever be stuck in IE7. No matter what I do, unless you know I, I call up Microsoft and get them to do that. So let's say I go to this site and I click that many you know times. Um, that means that I now put that site into I7 mode if it did not have a standards mode in the meta. Now with version targeting, if you have this, you see that center, that's the meta with the IE8. This is what you need in your documents, and I'll, have, I'll be able to give you these slides so you don't have to worry about uh, taking notes and everything. But this is what you're going to need in your documents, and of course this is written in, in XHTML format, just remember HTML doesn't take trailing slash, but you have to have this in there if you want the IE8 browser to always run your standards mode and never put you on that list. Does that make sense to everybody? I mean, it's a little nonsensical. So if it does make sense to you, I'm impressed. Because um, it doesn't really make all that much sense to me. <laughs> Basically, the bottom line is this. So if you have, now here's what you do. This is a, a general good, good guidelines for developers. If you are working on legacy sites, which most of you may well be, but, and you have access to be able to um, input a meta element, by putting in the IE7, um, you will allow those documents to be seen in IE8 as, as if they were still in IE6, right? So they would, they would still, they're still going to work no matter what. And you don't have to go in and repair that, is the point. Okay, so you drop the IE7 in there. If you're building new sites that are standards compliant and new documents, you drop this IE8 meta element in there. If you do not, if you do not drop one or the other in there, you are going to end up potentially on that compat list. Potentially. And if that happens, then you have to go back and redo the document anyway. So there's a big issue here, and it means a lot more work for developers, which is not a nice piece of information to have to give you. Um, so, of course, if you're saying IE8, what happens is uh, you have a web page, it sees IE7, it displays IE7. Okay. And there's also, uh, for those of you who've seen IE8, there's actually some really nice um, developer tools in it, for, for, which is good news. But one of them is the developer toggle here, where you can see that if you use this toggle, you can, um, it's almost like a fire button, right? So you can actually get in there and you can move it to corpse mode, which would be anything that would be below IE6, or IE6 without a proper dot type, okay? Um, IE5, anything below that. Um, if you look at the IE7 mode, then you can see it the way, you can see it if they are defaulted to IE7. And that would include like any legacy pages. It would be very good to drop the I7 compat in there, just to avoid problems if you can. Um, and anything new, IE. So that's the general, the general way to go. So this is the way that um, you know you kind of look at it. If you want all these things, right? If you want all of these benefits, then you have to do this with IE. And I, I really, um, just at, I'm just at mix. Um, Oh, about a week two, and that's a big event in Las Vegas that Microsoft does every year, and it's a it's a fun event. And I talked a lot to the people that I, I have worked with in the past, Ray Winninger and some other people that are on the IE team, the page, and what I was told. Now I was saying, look, I have concerns about this, of course, because what does this mean for developers around the world who are trying to do their darn best to make their sites as functional and cross browser and cross platform and accessible as they possibly can, you know, what can we do to assist anyway? 
Um, I said to them, do you really feel that, you know, are you going to get, they, they feel that this is a stopgap measure, but they're doing it in the meantime. And the rationale is because so many sites have been built for IE6, for IE only, that the amount of breakage that's going to occur scares them to death because the people are going to turn around and blame Microsoft. Well, you know, people have been turning around and blaming Microsoft for a while, so I don't see where that should be such a big concern about drop, you know, drop tried it, old, let's embrace. They told me they think that versioning will be with us in IE for the time to come, which is something I was not happy to hear. So yet another issue we might need to be prepared for, okay? Just bear in mind. So I think standards mode, if you are a standard-based web developer and you are doing things with CSS, you want to have good JavaScript, uh, advanced uh, uh, CSS uh, support, all of that, you need to be in IE standards mode for those sites to work. Okay? That's uh, all I have to say right now about IE. Opera, the wonderful company that I work for, um, where we're really, I think Opera is, is uh, our desktop product is getting much better, but we haven't really been very famous for that particular product. Of course, we're well known for what we do on mobile and alternative devices, which is very interesting. Um, but this, of course, is a fascinating company to work for because for the first time in my entire life as a standardista, I've actually not had to battle the company that I'm working with or for to talk about standards. In fact, I'm being given the power to come to talk to you about standards, right? And so that's really cool. So they are very, very big proponents of the open web and education. Uh, above and beyond their own products. So I really love that. I don't have to ever push products. I only talk about the standards in them, and that's really impressive to me. But one of the things about Opera that I have, I love to point out is that Opera is the innovator. When we think about the features that have all come around now in browsers that we use, Opera was really the, the, the place they started. You look at tab browsing, sidebars, Opera show, the small view, which enables us to do some testing right on the desktop for uh, um, like media queries and things like that, uh, for uh, uh, mobile devices. Um, we have support for media queries, we have complete SVG 1.1 support, we have CSS 2.1 support, we have some CSS 3, we have HTML5. So we're working on um, this premise that it's the best internet experience on any device. And that's really Opera's strength, I think. Um, Safari, how many Safari fans in here? Really some impressive stuff coming out of um, WebKit in general. They do have the first complete implementation of ARIA, which is very nice for accessibility and for application. Uh, they have CSS, this first uh, implementation of CSS animations, which are absolutely gorgeous. And unfortunately, I don't have any with me because Apple won't let me have them. <laughs> um, they have gradients, they have masks, uh, other effects, visual effects. CSS3 web fonts, which is something, of course, Opera has as well, the big components of that. And so this means for the designers who have been struggling with fonts for so long, we now actually are going to begin to see ways that we can bring the fonts, real rich fonts, into the web environment. Um, and of course, we have uh, Canvas, CSS Canvas in Safari. That's really interesting. Not HTML5 Canvas, but CSS Canvas. That's the first implementation. HTML5 Canvas and offline features. When I was talking about HTML5 before, the reason that HTML5 is being implemented in all browsers has more to do with some of this. Why am I running on a reserved battery? That is not good. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, there we go. So, yeah, the HTML5, so Canvas and the offline storage. That was a, that's a big piece. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to uh, Chrome. But we also have the, Safari has now added page zoom and text zoom. So there's actually a text zoom only, which I think is a great feature. Opera, of course, was the innovator of that. And now IE has it as well. So we have zoom methodology, which I think is really smart for, um, I really feel that, you know, text sizing and resizing, all the stuff that we have to do as developers and designers with fonts has been a big pain in the toughest. And really, when it comes to it, down to it, I'm, I'm suffering from aging eyes, right? That just happens to people. Of course, when you sit in front of a computer for 25 years, that happens even faster, right? So, you know, what essentially um, I'm finding is that the Zoom feature in the browser is far more useful than having to, like, resize text, okay? Because I can zoom to where I want to be, and then zoom right back to 100%, and 
don't have to worry. And it takes a huge worry off the you know, designer and developer. So I think I'm a big proponent of interface features like that. So good for Safari. Firefox, of course, developer, heaven in the browser, right? This is where most developers turn to, largely because of the tooling and the open source nature of the project, right? We have developer tools galore. What would we do without that web developer, you know, the whole web developer extension originally, which was, I mean, a lifesaver. Nothing before it um, really came close. And Firebug, of course, has become many people are using these tools every day. Yeah, see, I mean, it's just a really, now, Opera, we have Dragonfly, and we're working very hard to implement um, tools. So is Microsoft, i.e. also has some decent tools. Uh, but nothing beats the tooling in Firefox, and largely that's due to the fact that the tooling is developed by developers, for developers. So you end up with a great general standard support browser, good browsing experience, um, a huge fan base. So clearly, uh, it wins, Firefox will continue to win uh, in the developer space, I think, for a very long time. Uh, Chrome, how many people have checked out Chrome at all? Yeah, kind of an interesting browser. Um, Chrome is all about speed, okay? That's really what they're aiming for. But interestingly enough, the specs that they're putting out are not, are not the, the benchmark thing that they're doing is they haven't been using the right, we have a new JavaScript engine in Opera. It's called Sharapon. It's not out yet, right? And this JavaScript engine actually kicks Chrome. So we'll see what happens. But they're definitely creating very, they're, they're really, I think they're really trying to solve the speed problems. And the offline storage, we come back to this. Gears, okay, the technology that Google is working on called Gears. It, it, it's based on this whole concept of, okay, because my app is online, like Gmail or Calendar, right? How many people are using Gmail and Calendar to sort of, you know, Keep, keep track of everything, and I, I do. I mean, even though, I mean, I, pa I pass email through Gmail just so I have it somewhere, right? If not in my actual inbox, fine, right? So I think a lot of people use it that way too. So offline storage of Gears allows all of that data now, all the application data that you have to be stored in the browser. HTML5 does this as well with this offline storage. So this becomes very, very feature rich for us. So essentially, everything is becoming the browser. The client, the clients, the operating system is really big. the browser is really taking over that job. You see that more and more. So that's pretty interesting. It's in early days yet for Chrome, but they're uh, they're coming along. I'm not too happy with their their text right now. But other than that, it's pretty interesting. So let's see how much time I have. I have a few minutes. I'll give you a few demos. I'll show Canvas and um, and a couple of other things. And then we can do some Q&A. Special thanks, uh, uh, by the way, to Opera, Microsoft, Mozilla, Apple, Google, and Aaron for his wonderful compatible animations. All right, now let's see. I have some fun things here. Um, how many people have seen, have worked with Canvas at all? Anybody? So Canvas, essentially, is a really fascinating bit of um, of, of, a, of HTML5. Essentially what it does is creates a canvas, right? And using languages like JavaScript or SVG or even SMIL in some cases, using these languages we can go ahead and create interactive, rich, uh, rich experiences without ever touching. Um, I mean, everything is code-based, so I'll, sh I'll show you a little example here. So this is a game by Benjamin Joffe. And it's written in HTML5. And essentially, it's a maze. I mean, you can do all, I don't know why the, the computer is running a little slow because I think it uh, went down the battery. But as you can see, I'm moving around. I, can, I have complete uh, ability to move through the maze, forward. And you'd expect this, this sort of thing you saw a lot in early Flash, right? And people went, oh, how cool that is? Well, take a look at this. This is the document. What is it? It's all script. This is what the this is what HTML5 really is. When you think about HTML5, particularly with Canvas, this really brings home uh, the message that we are now in a rich application environment. So if you are wondering what steps to take in your own, um, uh, next step to take in your own education, JavaScript, 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 people. But amazing when you look at the canvas. So here, this is the entire 
This is the entire HTML. That's it to create that game. Everything else, it, everything else is contained within the canvas and is scripted. Pretty amazing stuff. So you can, you know, think of many, many, um, many uh, things that will, will be useful for that. This is a SVG uh, text and um, basically doing uh, iterations in circles. Again, when you look at the source, it's just absolutely fascinating to see what you've got. And in this case, also quite a bit of JavaScript. Right? So again, we're seeing just this incredible rise of, of, uh, of JavaScript. This crazy stuff that you can do, but again, the source, absolutely fascinating to me. I have a question. Sure. What is Microsoft excuses for not supporting Canvas? What is Microsoft excuse for not supporting Canvas? Um, good question. I'll have to ask them. <laughs> I'll let you know. <laughs> I'll let you know when I find out. <laughs> um, usually when they're asked why they don't support something, this is the, the general answer. Well, I'll give you the general answer, which is, we don't want to start implementing something until we know we can implement it fully. <laughs> so do with that what you will. And just something I wanted to show you. This is a media, media queries. Uh, and we'll, we'll start taking Q&A for this. But essentially, um, if, if you look, uh, oh gosh, I have to go with the CSS itself. But essentially what a media query does is it uses um, the app media, right, app rule and CSS. And you are basically able then to say, uh, to put in some, so if then, so you're able to put in some conditions and basically say, if the screen size is this, then deliver the style sheet. That sort of thing. So you're querying the media type coming in, and that way you deliver to the type of media the exact style that it deserves. One site, right? You don't create a mobile site, and you don't create a screen site, and you don't create a site for you know every other uh, device. You create one site, one document, okay? Multiple style sheets, and using app media to uh, to interpret this, you can go to small screen and you can see it immediately that I've made changes, um, oops, it's already my mail, uh, that certain things went away. And now it's completely different for the screen size that is required. <coughs> so with that, I would like to say thank you for putting up with me for 50 minutes. <laughs> I really appreciate the interest. And let's hear it from you know better browsers. Thank you.